Okay, in this video I'll be doing something a little different. Uh, I've got a personal collection of artifacts. And what I'm going to do is uh, show them to you up close. And uh, see how we can try to duplicate some of these. Uh, the reason why, one of the reasons why I stopped pressure flaking was because with an artifact like this, I couldn't reproduce the type of flaking that it has on it with a pressure flaker. And um, I'm pretty sure this is done with some sort of indirect percussion. Or a very fine pointed pressure flaker. My question on this piece is why it looks like it's a, an uncompleted piece with a broken base. But why would they... It looks like they were in the process of doing this edge. Uh, they would, were flaking it down to this point, flipped it over, flaked it down to that point. I guess they were going to continue flaking down. But this type of flaking is the same exact flaking I get with my indirect percussion technique. These, uh, these flakes run a long way with very little platform preparation that I can see. This edge does not look ground at all. Some of this looks snapped off. Like this flake runs almost all the way across. There's a large flake here. This one doesn't look like a pressure flake. It looks like an indirect percussion flake because it fans out. Uh, pressure flakes tend to be more, um, I don't know, oval shaped. They tend to fan out as much. Anyway, this is one of the uh, artifacts that I have that I that inspired me to look for something else besides pressure flaking. Here's another one that, uh, when I got it, it was intact, and I dropped it, and I broke it into three pieces. But you can see the thinness. These ears broke off, and I glued them back on. I'm not sure if we can see. There's a seam right there. But uh, just the... The thinness of the material and the brittleness of the material is amazing. I have some of this material and it, it is very brittle. And the edge is not retouched very much. There's just flakes taken off. It looks almost at random. And it was a very delicate tip on here at one time. I'm going to try to reproduce one of these points in a later video. Anyway, I'm going to uh, see if I can get it that thin and this type of flaking pattern. It looks like they've encountered the same type of step fractures that I encounter with uh, with the indirect because of such an enormous amount of force going through some of these are very deep step fractures I don't know what you call those but this one hasn't completely flaked off yet but it's very deep I get those a lot and uh, pressure flaking on something like this you would have to uh, put it down on a in your hand or in a pad I don't see how these would not break off in a flexible pad. They would have to have something either to hold it like this and flake it like this or indirect percussion or maybe even direct percussion on some of this but you couldn't do direct percussion on the ends or pressure flaking on the ends very effectively on something like this especially the tip that was on here. Anyway, I have uh, some more artifacts. I have a a knife, 
and just look at the edge on this. I don't know if you can see it. I've seen a lot of different reproductions and I had never seen a reproduction with an edge like that. So I've been trying to reproduce that type of edge and the only way I can do it is with indirect percussion. These flakes are large off a very delicate edge. Now how they did that, it was probably a wide, a wide tip billet with indirect percussion. That's my theory anyway. All these flakes are quite large and there's very little, if any, retouch. There's some, there's some retouch on there, but the majority of the thinning flakes are large and the edge is very, very thin. And it's incredible. It looks like it broke during manufacture. Uh, these knives were always made very thin. All the examples I've seen were thin, so I guess they they either made them thin or I didn't make them at all. And I think this is some sort of Georgetown flint. I have some material very similar to this. I guess the only other one I'm going to show right now is this little tiny point. It's a Toya point. And it's fascinating for me because the delicateness. Why would they make something so delicate for an arrow? And supposedly it would go through hide and bone and survive. Well, maybe it wasn't intended to survive. That's another question. Were some of these intended to survive? impact and some not. This is another arrowhead from uh, further north, northern plains, and the workmanship is outstanding. It is extremely symmetrical, very flat, very few ridges, and the flakes are large coming off the edge. So it looks like it has been retouched with a fine pressure flaker, but the other flaking, I don't know. This looks like a hunting point to me. It's very stout. It's got a stout design. The notches aren't too deep. The, uh, the blade is not recurved. It doesn't have a needle tip. This to me looks more like a uh, a war point, I guess, that would break if it hit somebody. It would do the job, but then it would break, and you couldn't fire it back. Same with this. I don't, I don't think this would be a hunting point. I think this would be more for war. But I have some in the collection that obviously are hunting type points because they're stout. They're more stout than the others. These are, to me, these are hunting points. And some of these other points are war points. I don't know if you can see that. That's done on the flake. That will definitely snap when it hits something. It will do the job, it will go in, but it will snap. Uh, that to me looks like a war point. And this is another Toya. Very thin, delicate. Also, I don't think they would use that for hunting. I don't know. Anyway, before this video gets too long, let me stop it right here, and we'll uh, try to duplicate one of these points.